I think we're smashing a stigma on mental health yeah. because 10 years ago it was like, oh my God, this guy, we can't talk. We can't speak about our problem yeah. because it, you're seen as like weak or inferior or whatever. I don't know what, what we think as insecure individuals. But now you got heavyweight champion of the world has come out and said he's very vulnerable and unwell. So then it's okay for everybody else to do that, yeah. I suppose. Chapter 14. 1,000 days. And then I tried cocaine. I can't really recall the first time I stuck it up my nose, other than it took place during the weeks or maybe months after the Klitschko fight. I think somebody must have offered it to me. Pal, they said. You want some of this? And given that I didn't care about anything at the time, I dived in and spent the next two years chasing a feeling that didn't exist. It was horrible stuff, a load of shite, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. The same goes for any drug. Every morning after doing cocaine, I found myself in a far worse emotional state than I'd been in before. And if I could have given my younger self some advice, it would have been this. Just say no. By the spring of 2016, my downward spiral seemed to be increasing in velocity, though luckily I wasn't destroying myself financially like some people had done in my position. That's because I wasn't blowing loads of money on gambling, drinks and going out. Whenever I went partying, I wasn't showing up at the doors of London's hottest joint. I was going to a dive in Morecambe, where a pint of beer cost around two quid. The worst part was the turmoil being inflicted upon Paris. It must have been horrible for her, seeing me falling apart in the way that I was. Despite this, the world outside our family carried on as if everything was running smoothly. The boxing machine kept ticking over. In April 2016, it was announced that I would be fighting Klitschko again that summer and this time it would be at the Manchester Arena, home advantage. That meant my gloves, my scales and my canvas. But the chances of me being ready for another heavyweight title contest were longer than a million to one shot, and when a press conference was held to promote the event, I rocked up and acted like a crazy person. I even ripped off my shirt to reveal the consequences of several months spent on the piss and the pastry. Legacies don't mean a lot to me, I said, as I began a speech that I have thought a lot about since. Boxing doesn't even mean much to me. Otherwise I wouldn't go into camp four stone overweight every time, having eaten every pie in Lancashire and drunk every pint in the UK. Here comes the really weird part, though. I hate every second of training, I continued. I hate boxing. I hate the lot. I hate speaking to you idiots. I'd rather be at home watching television and eating chocolate. As you will know by now, we're listening to this book. My words were completely out of character. I turned to Klitschko and gestured to my belly. Does that look like a fighter's body to you? No. Shame on you. You let a fat man beat you. Finally, I told the room what I really thought about my day job, the sport I'd spent my childhood fantasising about. I hate it, but I'm too good at it to stop. I hope Klitschko knocks me out because I can then retire and go on holiday. In preparation for the fight, I went running in the Lake District and sprained my ankle. I must have slipped on a curb or a step and tripped over, and the Klitschko rematch was postponed. Whether I felt relieved or not is hard to remember, because I was lost in the fog of depression, unable to get a grip on what was happening, and whether the events of my life really mattered. My guess is that I didn't care. When a person has lost the will to live, it's not as if they're going to give a hoot about a boxing match. While I fully own my destructive behaviour from this time, and I don't blame anyone but myself, I noticed something alarming in certain people around me during this period. They were clearly watching what was a slow-moving car crash, and it wouldn't have taken a genius for one of them to work out that I was very unwell and falling apart at the seams. Of course, this doesn't apply to Paris and a few close family and friends, who were my rocks. Yet despite my very public breakdown, nobody stepped in to help. Not one person from boxing pulled me aside and asked me if I was okay. Nobody wanted to know what was going on behind closed doors or if I needed support or even advice. Boxing didn't seem to care if I was emotionally broken. It just wanted to see the rematch. Fury versus Klitschko too, and my state of mind didn't seem to matter. My head was on fire. I was spiralling out of control, and at times I experienced intense panic attacks when my heart seemed ready to explode from my chest. At one point I even became convinced that my best friend Dave wanted to kill me, though that wasn't the case at all. 
Whenever I went to bed, I slept with a light on, because I would hear demons talking in the dark. I was afraid of the unknown, and not seeing what was with me in the room created a sense of dread. In my heaviest moments, I often thought about suicide, and then one morning I decided to give it a go. If you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please seek professional assistance immediately. Help is out there. I hope my story is an example that brighter days are ahead. You too can make your comeback. I opened my eyes, hating what I'd become, wishing that I'd died in my sleep, knowing it was time to end it all. Later that day, while driving around, I aimed my Ferrari at a bridge. With my feet pressed hard on the accelerator, the motor roaring, I knew that was only a second or two from a violent but blessed ending. Then suddenly, a voice called out, "Don't, don't do this. Think of your children. Don't let them grow up without a father." Don't let them think that you killed yourself because you couldn't handle it. At the last instant, I veered away from a devastating collision and slammed down on the brakes. I felt the car slowing, my heart racing, my soul knowing right then that I had to ask for support, because without it I was going to die and ruin the lives of everyone around me. I need help, I thought, medical help. My problem was that I didn't know where to go, or what to do when it came to the matter of getting my head fixed. I had zero clues about mental health, because in the traveller culture we didn't talk about those issues. Admitting to depression or some other psychological injury was considered a sign of weakness. Even when I later opened up to my family about the emotional problems bringing me down, they didn't have a clue about what to do. Up until that moment, I'd been in denial. I knew that something was wrong. I'd even said it out loud to people, but I didn't want to admit it to myself fully by asking for help. Doing so was the final step. In many ways, I was like an alcoholic who had been drinking three bottles of vodka a day, or making jokes about their addiction. Deep down, I knew it was bad, but reaching out for support was scary because there was a stigma attached to issues of the mind. In reality, I had to treat my head in much the same way that I would have treated a broken leg or a leaking pipe in the house. In those situations, I'd have called in the relevant specialist without giving it a second thought. My pain had to be considered in much the same way. In the end, I did some online research and checked in with what I hoped would be the best people in the area. One of them was a psychiatrist in Preston, when my problems were diagnosed. By the sound of things, I had the lot, but because of my paranoia and anxiety, I really didn't think the treatment that they then suggested would be for me at first. I even became worried about what would happen in those sessions. In the days leading up to my first consultation, I got it into my head that the doctor would inevitably go to the pub afterwards. A few pints in, he was bound to gossip with his mates about my condition. I could imagine the conversation that might take place, with everyone laughing at me. Yeah, I just had Tyson Fury in my office, the heavyweight champion of the world. He told me all these things. He's got all these problems. What a baby he is! That might be the reaction in some people when they meet a famous individual through work. They gossip with their mates about the encounter later on down the line. But the stakes aren't usually so great in those situations. Because the information being shared isn't as intensely personal. In my frazzled state, I assumed a doctor would do the same, not knowing that he or she was under a legal obligation to protect my information. In the end, I put my fears to one side and went anyway, because what other option did I have? It soon turned out to be the right move. For the first session, I showed up with my dad and brothers, and after a couple of appointments, I realised the work was becoming helpful, that there would be no silver bullet to my condition. In crisis, I learned a lot about myself. During one appointment, the doctor drew a line graph on a whiteboard. It was broken up with the occasional peak and trough. This is how a healthy person's life looks, he said. Then he drew another line. This time, the peaks and troughs were so extreme and frequent that the graph resembled the top of Bart Simpson's head. And Tyson, this is what your life looks like. He then explained my condition would need medication, but that I would be okay. Apparently, I was like a lot of other people because mental health issues were very common. You've bottled up your problems for so long that you've had a meltdown, he said. Clearly, there was a lot of work to be done. At first, I was placed on a suicide watch, where a psychiatrist explained how I'd been held together by my faith in God. Without it, they reckoned, I'd have made a successful job of killing myself. But it ain't going to hold you together forever, they said. As the work progressed. I started to realise how impactful my behaviour had been, and that I'd so nearly wrecked the lives of everyone in my family. 
driving into that bridge at top speed wouldn't just have ended my life. It would have destroyed Paris's and the kids, too. How could I be that person, I thought. How could I do that? How could I be so selfish? That was a terrifying realisation, but at least it was something. Feeling pain meant that I was healing, at least. In the past few years, there had been long periods when I hadn't felt anything at all. While all of this was going on, the United Kingdom anti-doping, UCAD, charged my cousin Huey and me, claiming to have found elevated levels of the banned substance Nandrolone in our systems. I can tell you right now that I've never taken a performance-enhancing drug in my life, but UCAD claimed that my results from a February 2015 urine test after my fight with Christian Hammer had shown higher levels of Nandrolone than normal. It's produced naturally by the body and reduces tiredness and helps muscle growth. For a while, it looked as if I was going to be suspended, but that was eventually lifted after an appeal, and I was free to carry on fighting once the matter was resolved in 2017. Following my ankle injury, a new date for the Klitschko fight was set for October 2016, again at the Manchester Arena, and the boxing machine put me through the wheels once more. I wasn't having any of it, though. When another press conference with Klitschko was arranged in London that September... Nobody informed me until the night before. Why, I'm not sure, but I wasn't exactly pleased. I'm not doing it, I said, which, as you know by now, wasn't like me. I love a press conference. I just wasn't in the right state of mind. Whoever told me had looked shocked. When the press conference kicked off the next day, my manager, Mick Hennessy, told the room that my car had broken down and the battery in my phone had died. The same could be said of my boxing career. I was forced to withdraw from the Klitschko rematch, not for fighting reasons, but for medical ones. My head wasn't up to it. The statement was delivered by Mick Hennessy. Medical specialists have advised that the condition is too severe to allow him to participate in the rematch and that he will require treatment before going back into the ring. Tyson will now immediately undergo the treatment that he needs to make a full recovery. We and Tyson wish to express our sincerest apologies to all those concerned with the event and all the boxing fans who had been looking forward to the rematch. Tyson is understandably devastated by the development. A couple of weeks later, I delivered an interview with Rolling Stone magazine in which I told the journalist that I hoped somebody killed me before I was able to kill myself. I even claimed it would be my last interview. Before long, I'd given up my WBA, WBO and IBO titles. I was done. Despite seeing a psychiatrist, I still drank and parted hard though at least I was now imagining a time when I might turn the corner. I'd go to the pub and sink ten pints, while convincing myself I was going back to training the following morning. But when the hangover inevitably kicked in, I'd put my boxing comeback on hold for a little while longer. During 2017, my life felt like a never-ending season of false dawns. Then, in October, I ended up at a Halloween party, dressed in a skeleton outfit, so nobody knew who I was, with yet another pint of beer in my hand but a switch was flipped. It was like I'd experienced a moment of clarity. As I looked about the room, I saw university students, kids at the beginning of their lives, and here I was, a grown man, the former heavyweight world champion, with a wife and family drinking myself silly. You've been at the pinnacle of your career, I thought, and you've chucked it all away. What's going on? What are you doing here? I put my pint down and went home. I walked upstairs took off the stupid skeleton outfit and dropped to my knees. Then I prayed to God and cried like a baby. I can't do this anymore, I said. I've had enough of this life. I can't do it on my own. If there's any way back to boxing for me, please bring me back, because I can't take life without boxing. With hindsight, that party was a turning point for me, 100%. In those blurry moments in the pub, as I took in the scene, I had a moment of sanity. I realised I shouldn't have been there. I should have been at home, and there's no doubt that the realisation started my healing process. Where I would have still arrived at that point had I not gone to a party dressed in a skeleton costume is a whole other matter for debate. You never know what's down for your life, or what might be around the corner. What I do know is that a bookie doing the odds on a Tyson Fury comeback would have taken one look at me and laughed. I weighed around 28 stone. I'd had my boxing licence suspended by the British Boxing Board of Control after the psychiatrist had deemed me medically unfit to fight. The following morning I got out of bed, pulled on my sweatsuit and went for a jog. My plan was to run a mile out and a mile back, 
but as my trainers hammered the pavement, I realised my body couldn't do it. I was that fat and knackered. Talk about demoralising. As I strolled back to the house, having done half of what I was hoping, I pulled out my phone and scrolled through social media. I don't know why, but I went to Deontay Wilder's page. As I moved down the screen, I saw a post in which he said he'd seen a picture of me. He was declaring me finished. A little further down, he reckoned it was a shame that we'd never fought one another. Wilder also reckoned he could punch Mike Tyson out in one round. That pissed me off. Unknowingly, he had lit a firework underneath me. For those comments, I'm going to come back and I'm going to knock you spark out, I thought. At that time, there had been all sorts of toing and froing between Anthony Joshua and Wilder over a potential fight. Will they, won't they? They are. They're not. He said, she said. It had been boring on for about a year. I knew then I was taking the bull by the horns. Joshua ain't got the bollocks to do it, so it's going to take an old, fat, bald-headed fella to come out of retirement, nearly three years out of the game, to beat Deontay Wilder. The comeback of all comebacks had begun. A quick footnote before we move on. If there was one positive from my breakdown, it was the very public nature of it. It showed me as being mortal. Yeah, I was unwell and hurting, but I needed to go through that experience to become the man I am today. What I hope is that there are some people who will look and learn from my experience. And know this. There's nothing wrong in asking for help. It saved my life. It might save yours, or the life of someone you love. I really decided that I wanted to be open on this return. Like, I wanted to document as much struggle as humanly possible. Yeah, I wanted to help as many people as I could with the the comeback. So I wanted everything in there. Now, if I didn't want to do that, I'd have never talked about it openly and did a million interviews and wrote books about it and been on every TV station in the world talking about it. So I could have kept it all to myself and, and had a private bit with it. But I knew that beyond everything else, beyond sport, that it'd save a lot of people's lives. They're, they're just a story of it and that someone can come back from the brink of defeat to get back on track. Now, not everybody can be world heavyweight champion, but everybody can use that to influence their lives as well in their struggle. Because although our lives are different and we have different paths, the struggle is still the same. Everyone can relate to the struggle. Anyone who's suffering has the same struggle. Whether you're a king of a country or whether you sweep up the roads outside, you can have the same struggle. But people didn't know that until today. So today it's more open. It's more out in the, in yeah. the public domain that it's okay not to be okay. So, and it's more, more, more than now than ever. And there's more and more sportsmen coming out now. Like there was on the UFC the other night, Paddy Pimblett. He came out and he spoke about mental health because his friend had killed himself. And, you know, he, he, he was, he, he done a good job because he's brought UFC people to it as well. So yeah. fantastic. The first step, in my opinion, is accepting that you're unwell. Because I didn't accept that I was unwell for a long period of time. Yeah, when did you think it really started? When I was like five or six years old. But I didn't understand it. I had no education on it. I didn't know anything about it. Right up until I was about 29, till I got diagnosed. So up until then, I had no no education on it at all. I just thought it was normal for everyone to feel down all the time. I like, just get through it, like man up, get through it, whatever. But the advice is first is accepting. Like like when you go to A&A and you say, oh, I'm Steve and I'm an alcoholic. The first step is admitting that you've got a problem. If I'd have had another two or three fights like I was supposed to, then it would have been easier. But to lose 10 stone and come back from all that rubbish, to then fight Wilder in the same year, it's pretty difficult. Chapter 15. The Second Coming. At the beginning of November, still fired up by Deontay Wilder's social media post, I called the personal trainer Ben Davison. If you don't know this story already, we first met at a boxing show in Glasgow during 2016. Fast forward a year and Ben was in Marbella working on the fitness levels of my pal, the middleweight Billy Joe Saunders, as he prepared to defend his WBO title. I went over to visit and even did a little training, despite my hating boxing at the time. 
While there, Ben and me had hit it off, and when I decided to make a return to the ring in 2018, I knew he was the man to get me back in shape. Having asked him, Ben moved into the Fury family's Morecambe house, where we started a six-week fitness programme. We then flew out to another training camp in Marbella in January 2018, and in the process, I dropped a ton of weight. I had the spark again, the old Tyson Fury was coming back to life, and Ben was very much behind the transformation. It helped that he was a young lad, only in his mid-twenties at the time, and without the commitment of a wife or kids. He was able to work with me whenever and wherever I wanted, without too much disruption. Our working relationship had clicked, like I sensed it would. The fact that Ben hadn't yet trained another boxer to a belt wasn't a concern either. He would later help Billy Joe to defend that first WBO title. That's because I didn't need the world's greatest coaching minds behind me to win boxing matches. I only required someone with enough knowledge to steer me in the right direction. Ben was a mate. That was the most important thing. And I didn't need someone screaming at me, or a ball breaker, because I've never responded positively to that style of coaching. I wanted someone to help me back to my old self and have a laugh at the same time. Credit to him, Ben managed it. And in the space of eight months or so, I shifted ten stone. Despite this brutal change, Ben's training was fun. The sparring sessions that had been so self-destructive during my darker days became pleasurable again. But that's because I was finding my way back to an emotionally stronger spot. I had purpose. My aim was to fight at the top level, the place where I belonged, rather than being a fat mess looking on from the sidelines. The work was life-changing too, and since those days of training with Ben in 2018, I don't think I've had a week out of the gym. The upgraded Tyson Fury was a different animal. My fire was back, and knowing that inspired me to work even harder. As I kept improving bit by bit, I never once rested on my laurels, because I was constantly looking for more. That's how greatness is forged, especially in a sport like boxing. A fighter that settles for mediocrity never fulfils their true potential. Meanwhile, having already won the world heavyweight title, there was nothing more I needed to achieve and nothing left to lose, because I had lost it all already with no fixed objectives in the distance to obsess over, as I had done with Klitschko, I was able to soak up everything that was happening, and I appreciated it all, understanding that nothing lasts forever, the good and the bad. I wasn't yet out of the woods with regards to my mental health, though. While I was undoubtedly getting better with each passing month, the demons were proving hard to shake off. I continued sleeping with the light on, but that was happening because I was still suffering from anxiety and feeling uncertain of what the future might bring. Whereas depression, from what I could tell, was partly the result of having past regrets. Still, I was happy to press ahead with my punishing fitness regime, knowing that I'd become engaged in a lifelong battle to stay emotionally healthy. No matter what people say about mental illness, the type of which I was suffering, recovery is an ongoing process, in much the same way that an alcoholic or a junkie is never really cured of their addictions. Every day is going to be a fight, I've had to keep my problems at bay with a long, stiff jab. That was a hard pill to swallow at first, but I've long known that the most valuable things in life arrive after a bit of a scrap. Easy was going to the pub on a daily. Easy was eating every bag of chips in sight. Easy was whacking on ten stone. Hard was getting my head straight, as was returning to the fitness levels I'd enjoyed when duffing up the likes of Klitschko and Derek Chisora. Annoyingly, Being healthy requires a lot of motivation and discipline. If it didn't, we'd all be walking around shredded, able to run a 20-miler without breaking sweat. Not that I was interested in either of those things, because I had found a much more powerful motivator. My mental fortitude was everything. While my return to fitness gathered pace, and I went through the process of getting my suspended boxing licence unsuspended, it felt as if a weird wall of silence had gone up around the world of boxing. I noticed that very few people gave a damn about me. I certainly don't remember too many people from the sport calling me to check if I was okay, even after my very public withdrawal from the Klitschko fight and that infamous Rolling Stone interview. I realised once again, when a boxer is doing well, as I had been for several years, certain people are happy to stick their hands out for money. But when that same athlete is down on their luck, badly injured or at the end of their career, those figures don't seem to care. I was in a unique position. For a brief while, I had stood at the top of the boxing ladder and experienced how the game worked. 
On the way up, people wanted to talk to me. They tried to offer me new opportunities and deals. They acted like they cared. But in the spring of 2018, having ragdoll to the bottom of the ladder and being as close to death as a person could get without a game being over, I found the experience to be so very different. The opportunities and deals dried up. My phone never rang. Because of my breakdown, I was out in the cold. This poor treatment didn't bother me while I was in the thick of my issues because I'd been willing to meet my maker at the time. So if I didn't care about my life or the people around me, I was hardly going to care about how people viewed me or my business. That said, once I'd got into a better place, I realised that boxing had nothing in the way of aftercare for a person like me, and that was a problem. For a time, I found myself in serious trouble, but there was nobody in the sport to turn to for help. There were no therapists or experts to lean upon. My experience was that vices were used and abused and then kicked to the curb. The attitude from the money grabbers in those situations seemed to be very clear. Never mind, we'll feast off the next one. I've made this point in the past, but it bears repeating, because it's an important issue. This attitude isn't just confined to boxing. In a number of sports where physical sacrifices are made, and personal safety is put on the line, and in services like the military, people work hard for their careers. Then, when that chapter in their life comes to an unexpected close, or they experience a serious injury, they are immediately thrown onto the scrap heap. For those individuals whose fortunes are being played out in the public eye, the situation can feel even more intense, because suddenly everyone has an opinion on their demise. A track and field champ can be deemed worthless overnight, even though they were doing well a year or so previously. A Premier League footballer might be branded as rubbish, despite having played for their country. Once finished, those people discover that nobody wants to know them anymore. That is a very lonely and triggering place to be, especially if they are emotionally vulnerable. My situation was a little different, in that I had a chance of returning to the very top. If I did, I promised to remember the individuals that had forgotten me so easily and I would never attend one of their fancy dinners or awards presentations again. To get my boxing licence back, I had to prove I was both emotionally strong and physically ready. To do so, I visited the same psychiatrist that had previously declared me medically unfit after withdrawing from the Klitschko fight. In the end, I was judged to be in good enough shape to compete again. The British Boxing Board of Control reinstated my licence. This followed the conclusion of my dispute with UCAD, over the detected nandrolone levels in my system. The process had gone on for a couple of years. With my return to the world stage confirmed, I only had to figure out who to fight and when. Frank Warren first lined up the Albanian Sefa Seferi, and the stage for my second coming was set. Seferi was fairly unknown at the time, having previously fought in the cruiserweight division, and wasn't considered as being too dangerous. The tail of the tape wasn't worrying either. He was ten years older, six inches shorter and nearly five stones lighter. My reach was ten inches longer too. But on the other hand, Seferi had been in 24 fights and only lost once. He also had a good knockout ratio. As far as I was concerned, he was a solid opponent for my first fight in three years. The match wasn't about the opponent though. It was all about my return to the ring and when the Manchester Arena was announced as the venue, home turf, 15,000 tickets were sold. Thankfully, lots of people still wanted to see the Gypsy King up close. As the date approached, I felt like a fish cooped up in a tank. I wanted to be released into the ocean where I belonged. Though weirdly, I think Seferi was just as excited as me. He asked for so many pictures during the build-up to the fight that for a while I wondered whether I'd been his hero at some point. He was getting paid a lot of money to fight me as well. As long as he got out of the ring in one piece, Seferi was going to be okay. Given my breakdown had been so messy and public, there was a chance I was going to take a bit of stick from my opponents in the coming fight, but I wasn't worried. During my second career, I can only really recall Deontay Wilder saying anything, and I can't remember what exactly, so it can't have been that bad. Seferi didn't behave in that way, though he probably didn't know what to expect from our fight. There's a chance he might have considered me to be way past my best, as a lot of people did. Certainly, a large percentage of boxing fans and fighters were probably underestimating my chances of making a significant comeback beyond Seferi, but that was nothing new. In my first career, 
Opponents judge me on my body shape, as if that was any indication of what I could or couldn't do in the ring. They took one look at me and thought, he's an overweight bloke, there's no way he can fight. Yeah, I might have appeared slow, clumsy and horrible from a distance, but after thirty seconds close up, whoever was trapped in a ring with me usually uncovered a very unpleasant truth. Going against the Gypsy King is like trying to carry a two-ton weight to the summit of Everest. The thing is, I've never been bothered about how I appear, or how people perceive my image. Some fighters fuss over their style. They look chiselled, as if they've been cut from granite, but they are more like male models than warriors. I am not one of those blokes, and I'm very happy about it, thank you very much. I love having a dad bod. I'm good with love handles. When people imagine a heavyweight champion of the world, they usually picture a cut, athletic-looking dude. They never consider a person who looks like me, which is a mistake, because the Gypsy King can fight like an animal. The same goes for my hair. I much prefer being bald to those times in my younger days when I had a bunch of curly locks sprouting from my skull. Most of the time, I looked like a big mop head, and the style became a real mess whenever I fought. With each landed punch, my fringe flew all over the place, which created the impression that I'd been really hit, especially when it was sweaty. After a while I shaved it off, because I like being bald. Not because I want to intimidate my opponents, that isn't my style, I'm all about having fun. The Safari fight was a good example of that attitude. On the night of the fight, I gave him a peck on the lips as we bumped gloves at the start of the fight. The commentators couldn't believe what they were seeing, but I knew I had to make an immediate impression. The sport had become mind-numbing in my absence, like it had been during the reign of Klitschko. In the build-up to every fight, two boxers stepped into the press conference and shook hands or wished one another good luck. But everyone was being too respectful. Where was the fire and lightning? Boxing is a form of show business. With my return, it was going to be like a circus again. I walked out to a mash-up of famous comeback hits. LL Cool J's Mama Said Knock You Out and Without Me by Eminem. The DJ following up by making a knowing nod to my breakdown with Afro Man's hit Because I Got High. Once Return of the Mac by Mark Morrison had kicked in, the crowd was left in little doubt that I was hoping to pick up from where I left off. A chant ricocheted around the seats. One Tyson Fury. There's only one Tyson Fury. One Tyson Fury. After all my struggles, it felt extra sweet to be back. I was exactly where I wanted to be. I fed off the crowd, and they gave me all the energy I needed. The fun and games really began once the fight was underway. I worked out very quickly that Safari was there for the taking whenever I fancied it, but I needed a few rounds under my belt. The quality of opponent was only going to increase in the coming contests, so the longer the bout went on, the better it was for me. I needed to find my match legs again and to box away any rustiness. I let him come at me in the first, pulling faces at the crowd as he did so. I was fully in control of the situation. I put my hands above my head and invited him on. I danced across the canvas, and at one point I even fainted to throw a haymaker. Then I drew a telling off from the ref for pirouetting 360 degrees in the ring and making a comment or two to the crowd. He'd clearly seen enough of the horseplay, so I loomed over Safari with every attack. By round three, I was landing some heavy punches, and as soon as I knuckled down and threw a couple of solid hits, it was game over. Safari retired in his corner before the fifth. The comeback was on. A few months later, I defeated the German Francesco Pianetta to complete one of the most thrilling returns in sporting history. I'd survived an emotional meltdown, the vacating of my belts, and a suicide attempt to make it back to the world of professional boxing. It also felt as if people wanted to see me succeed again. That might have been because I was now more like the average person on the street than a supreme athlete, one of those chiselled model types I mentioned earlier. Instead, I resembled the average Joe, the sort of person you might see propping up the bar in your local boozer, with all his flaws and problems. I suppose that vulnerability and normality had captured the public's imagination, because when they looked at me, they probably found it hard not to see a little bit of themselves. A boxing legend was working alongside Ben Davison in my corner for those first two comeback fights. Ricky the Hitman Hatton, the former world champion in both the welterweight and light welterweight divisions. I first met Ricky before he became a top fighter, at a boxing show, in a working man's club in Sale. 
He was an amateur at the time. In fact, it was so early on in his career that people referred to him as Richard. The Ricky and Hitman monikers would come later on. I could only have been 11 years old. Because the show was taking place in those days before the smoking ban had kicked in, a cloud of cigarette smoke swirled about the venue like a pea soup fog. After that night, Ricky quickly became one of my favourite boxers. In fact, I'd go as far as to call him one of my childhood heroes. I watched all of his fights on the telly because he was fearless and ferocious. He wasn't intimidated by anybody and I loved the way he used to get stuck in. The hitman was a natural entertainer. He was also one of the few people in boxing to have reached out to me when I became seriously ill. I had bumped into him in Manchester one night, at a time when I was as big as a house. You should get back into training, said Ricky, and we swapped numbers. From time to time, he would check in to see if I was OK, which was appreciated, because I knew that he had gone through some serious health issues of his own. In 2010, Ricky was reportedly admitted to the Priory Rehab Centre due to his struggle with booze and depression. After we'd met, I saw some videos of him smashed, falling over and not looking too good. So I returned the favour and called him to see if he's OK. Look, if you need any help or whatever, give us a call, I said. If you need any advice, let me know. I've been through it all myself. Before the Safari and Pianetta contests, I was training out of Ricky's gym in Manchester. I saw Ricky all the time and we got very pally, to the point where I reckoned he would be a good addition to my team. Do you want to come into the corner, I said. Ricky loved the idea. It was good to have him in there with me for moral support. Having a legend of the game to back me up from time to time felt reassuring. And with a childhood hero in my corner, the future felt bright. The first Wilder fight, let's just say this, I was nowhere near ready for someone of that calibre. I was not at my best, nowhere near. Well, it was a dangerous move. It was very, very bold, brash move. And I should have never have taken that fight. But me being me, jumped in the deep end straight away. If I'd have had another two or three fights like I was supposed to, then it would have been easier. But to lose 10 stone and come back from all that rubbish, to then fight Wilder in the same year, it's pretty difficult. Losing 10 stone in that year, it's a massive task alone, isn't it? Never mind going in there with the biggest puncher in boxing history, an active fighter who'd had 10 defences in the time I was out of the ring. The actual weight loss is not that hard. I've always struggled with weight. I've just had four days off and put £11 on. And in those four days, I train twice a day each day. No coffees, yeah. no Diet Cokes or Zeros, and no alcohol. feel better. And I've come off social media. I've been off that yeah. a month as well. Yeah. And I feel much better. I don't feel like it's made a difference, the drinking coffee and the Cokes and all. Not a difference. Nothing. There's no, there's no benefit from me not having a coffee or a Diet Coke. None. But that's a challenge for me as a man, as a person, to challenge myself to see if I can stop the things that I love to do. Like the first thing I do in the morning, regardless of where I am in the world, is wake up and have a coffee and then follow it by another four afterwards. Yeah. I literally love coffee and I don't like instant coffee. It's got to be proper ground beans. Yeah. I've become like a coffee connoisseur. Yeah. Um I've tried all these beans from all over the world and I find out the ones I like and I like it with certain types of sugar-free syrup and skim milk hot, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. I really do take it to the extreme with these coffees. <laughs> That's why I'm having like four or five of them a day minimum. There was no benefit of me not doing it, but like I say, I don't want... I've been drinking coffee like that for seven years now and I thought to myself, you know what? I like coffee and I like to drink these Diet, Diet Cokes and Zeros. And I do like having a beer with the boys now yeah. and again. So I'm going to take away the things that I like to do. Why? Just to test a challenge.